Welcome to Florida Focus, a college football podcast. This is a podcast where a lifetime Florida State Seminole fan, that's me, Brandon, is usually joined by Chris. Today, we're continuing our conversation on a recruiting recap with uh, Jared Johnson. Jared, thanks for being on the show. Oh, absolutely, Brandon. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, we kind of left off. We covered the big three, um, how well Florida State, Florida, and Miami did in recruiting. So, of course, over the last couple of seasons where none of us have uh, turned a blind eye to the success that the UCF Knights have had. So um, let's take a second just to talk about how the school's success um, in Orlando has an, had an impact on recruiting and what are some of the things you noticed about the uh, just the general uh, recruiting landscape in the state of Florida since Scott Frost and Josh Heupel took over UCF? Yeah, absolutely. So one thing about the state of Florida, and I think it's a consensus for everybody, is there is just so much talent um, within the state. There's players at you know, every part of the state, North Florida, South Florida, Central Florida, North Central Florida. I mean, you can find uh, legitimate Division One college football players really at every level. And that's kind of unique, uh, I think, in the state of Florida is that you could have a 2A school who could produce just as much Division One talent as a 5A school. And I think that's just a testament to how much talent is in the state of Florida and, um, you know, how much these schools are able to kind of bring in that talent. One thing that we've seen with UCS, UCF is that though they necessarily haven't had a bump from the uh, the winning seasons, they've brought in a lot of players that they've needed and they've been able to maintain really kind of the top dog spot in the AAC uh, in recruiting. So, you know, you look at a you look at a school like UCF, who's obviously going to bring in the number one class in the AAC this year, only going to be ranked 57th overall nationally. But you look at last year, you know, the number two class in the AAC. Um, you look at the next year, you know, they're probably on deck to have probably the number one class again in the AAC. So while you may have not seen necessarily a national bump in that ranking, what you have seen is them sort of take over the conference as far as recruiting success goes. Um, and that's probably a lot to do with, really putting putting themselves on the map you know before UCF may have not been an option for a lot of people and now you look at them the winning seasons really do have an effect in my opinion because you you're on TV more you're in the marquee matchups more you know you're in the big bowl games more and kids around the state you know who may have turned a blind eye to that school before are now saying wait 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 you know we can go play we can go play Auburn in New Year's Six Bowl or you know we can go play SEC school opening day so it's kind of one of those things where I think that they're starting to gain a lot of attention uh, through those big wins and those big games. All right. Yeah, I, I think I agree. There's there's a lot of to be said about, okay, the big three are going to get the talent. And, I mean, we'll, we'll dive into UCF here in a second. But, you know, UCF doesn't sign any four or five-star commits from the state of Florida. You know, those guys are going elsewhere. But it really hasn't dampened the spirit, as you mentioned. They continue to get uh, the best of the rest. And that's probably the biggest thing the AAC, in my opinion, has lacked is just consistency. You know, until UCF really made the run they've made the last couple of years, it's, okay, is it Tulsa that's going to step up? Is it Cincinnati? Um, do Do you get any success from Tulane? All of these schools that are scattered everywhere. Uh, UCF is clearly the team to beat and they're, they're having a dominant run in the conference. So yeah, that's what I'm hoping it brings. And that's the trend that I'm personally seeing so far. Yeah, it's really great. Um, you know, it's really great to have exposure within the state. You know, I know obviously we're fans of quote unquote, big three schools. Um, you with Florida state, obviously me with Florida, but in, you know, for a long time, you really don't think about, you know, UCF games or you don't think about USF games or FAU, FAU you know, they're just there. And they're on. But one of the things I think UCF has brought to the table is they brought a lot of fun to the state because not only now is there an option on Saturday uh, after the Gator game or before the Gator game or before the Noel game or after the Noel game is now you can you can tune in UCF and like be really entertained. Uh, they have a lot going for them. And, you know, obviously best wishes to McKenzie Milton. I hope he gets back on the field soon and healthy. I uh, would love to see him continue to play. You know, he's great out there on the field. So it's kind of one of those things where in recruiting it's reflected because now you're having players who – not only are signing with UCF, like you said, the best of the rest, but now you have some pretty marquee um, names who are transferring into that program. Mm-hmm. And that's really where I think you're going to see over the next cycle um, UCF sort of make strides is maybe you don't crack those four-star, five-star recruits, but maybe some of those big names who are buried in the depth chart at other schools are now seeing UCF as a legitimate option to contend for you know a lot of on-field success. Excellent. So with that, um, 
we'll, we'll go ahead and let you weigh in on your impressions. Uh, what were some some big name guys that you saw that they got, or maybe some guys they missed on, and your overall ranking of what you gave the Knights? Absolutely. So UCF was able to sign 22 players. Um, they featured 13 from in the state. Uh, so that's pretty big, pretty big numbers. Good to see UCF walking down the state. As we mentioned, there's a lot of uh, state and talent. They were able to get two top 50, 150 JUCO players. Um, and I think that's a big deal. So basically what I'm saying is you have two players who are ranked in the top 50, 150 of all the JUCO players. You have 6'3", 235 uh, linebacker, Jalen Pinkney out of Hutchinson Community College in Kansas. Now he's a former Vanderbilt Commodore. So that's another guy who is signing with the Knights, has Division One experience, has Division One success even, and now he's, you know, was a Vanderbilt Commodore in the SEC. Now he's going to be UCF Knights, should be able to plug a hole at linebacker for them relatively easy. And then another player that I think UCF is probably excited about is 6'2", 170-pound uh, pound cornerback, Tay Gowan out of Butler Community College in El Dorado. Uh, he's another player who has a lot of range, a lot of athleticism, and really could, you know, see the field for for UCF and kind of make an impact on that boundary as they kind of look for some for some answers there. UCF was able to sign four players on the defensive line and four on the offensive line. So Coach Heupel really kind of addressing the needs of depth along the line of scrimmage because you know, as you know, football is still a game that's won and lost on the line of scrimmage. So all in all, you know, I feel I feel UCF addressed a lot of needs and. It's really tough when you look at when you look at grades because I feel like you can't really grade on the same scale as like, you know, an Alabama or a Clemson, um, even a Florida State and a Florida. I think where UCF grade and this is why I'm probably going to give them a higher grade is I feel like I feel they addressed a lot of their needs. Um, when you look at a class like Florida's failed to address all their needs, Florida State failed to address all their needs. UCF really did a great job of addressing all their needs. And that's why I would honestly give him an A minus. I know a lot of listeners out there may be like, "This guy's crazy," you know. They the highest player they signed was 634th nationally. Like I get it, but I'm looking at were they able to get the players they need to fill their program for the future? Okay. And I feel like UCF did a good job of that. Oh, that's that's still pretty fair. And yeah, you're right. If you're talking about Group of Five versus Power Five, then you know it really is a very different style and. Uh, very different competition. So uh, a couple of things that stood out to me is uh, since McKenzie Milton, uh, the, the Knights have really become a pipeline for the 808. Uh, they really get a lot of guys from Hawaii. So they signed a two or three guys there. And, and it's pretty clear uh, that the success isn't helping recruiting as much as we would have thought. But the, the advantage they have is they really true sell a family atmosphere and they have the advantage of playing time as we kind of alluded to. Um, if, if I'm UCF, the way I continue to get guys, I hammer home the NFL talent, uh, the yeah. Griffins, all the Brandon Marshalls, anyone else, um, who's had success at that level. That's how you're going to get guys to keep coming along with the playing time. And another thing that stood out to me was, uh, like you said, the guys, as you, I'll quote you, uh, buried on the depth chart, they got Brandon Wimbush from Notre Dame. That's a big get. And they also, I saw had a, a transfer from Virginia tech and from Duke. Yeah. So. Uh, Brandon Wimbush, uh, transfer quarterback from Notre Dame, is immediate is eligible immediately. He can play right now. He can play. He's going to participate in spring drills. Um, day one uh, football, he could roll out and be the starter. He's eligible to play. Another uh, Jordan Hayes, a safety from Duke, he's also eligible immediately to play. So, um, and then you mentioned the two guys from Virginia Tech, Cam Good, the defensive tackle, who is a name. I'm, I'm sure college football fans should be familiar with the name Cam Good. Uh, he's played some snaps, and then Audrey Kearney. Also, the inside linebacker from Virginia Tech. So, you know, that's four Division One, uh, a Division One big time program transfers right there. Uh, two of which, and I'm not sure about the Virginia Tech guys, but I know for a fact that Hayes and Wimbush are both eligible to play right now. So, that those are big. I mean, that's that that's big time. Yeah. Yeah. So I think yeah. I, again, I like what you said. You grade them on a different scale, and and relative to their schedule, they did fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So transferring uh, over to another school, uh, this, they did not have a good go of it, in my opinion. But what were some of your thoughts on how uh, the Bulls and Charlie Strong did over in Tampa? Yeah, man. So the South Florida Bulls. So, you know, to come off the disappointing, uh, really the disappointing seven and six season with that big loss to Marshall, uh, 38 to 20. And was that that was the Gasparilla Bowl, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. So they have that really like really bad finish. And then honestly, 
it just transitioned right to a terrible finish in recruiting. Uh, 77th rated class. Um, and then once again, they don't crack the top 50 because, you know, they were 65th last season. The big telltale for them, though, again, just like with UCF, I don't want to hammer too much on the overall national rating. What I want to look at is that they only finished sixth in the AAC. Hmm. And I think that with all the talent in the state of Florida and all the guys that are still left to sign is, you know, fifth in the AAC is just not going to cut it when you're looking at being able to compete with UCF, being able to transition out of kind of a bad season for Coach Strong. Mm. Uh, fifth in the AAC is not where you want to be. You know, last year they finished third in the AAC. So they've shown the ability to recruit the conference well, but this year they just didn't do it. Now, not all was terrible. They were able to sign MacArthur Burnett, um, the former Florida Gator uh, from Coffeyville Community College in Coffeyville, Kansas. Oh yeah, yeah. he's gonna he's gonna come on. He's gonna be a he's gonna be USF Bull. So that's that's gonna be some help on the boundary corner Division One experience. Now he wasn't overly successful. At Florida, but he wasn't necessarily all the way terrible. It's just really hard to get on the field um, at the cornerback position at Florida. So, I mean, I think he's a talented guy. He should be able to factor into that to that class really well. They do sign 19 guys. Um, we mentioned Barnett. Um, and then really kind of the, the trick for them was they were only able to sign 19 because last year they took so many players. So they do sign um, a really – um, Dequan Evans, another cornerback, is from Orlando, so I, I like his game. Um, he 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 had a great he had a great senior season. I think he's he's kind of what they look for as far as athleticism goes. Um, they signed Jaden Curry, who's another cornerback out of IMG, so a guy who has the pedigree to to play big time football. So for them, you know, it just comes down to again filling needs. You don't sign a lot of players along the offensive line. And, you know, a lot of it's because they were able to sign some guys last year. But I just don't think Coach Strong overall addressed what they, they kind of needed from this class. Yeah, it, it seems to me that oh, he's kind of getting other schools' leftovers, which, I mean, isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it has to translate into success. And, and did I get it correctly, Jared? All 19 commits were from the state of Florida? All 19 are from the state of Florida. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> yeah. So... You know, and like you know, like we talked about, there's just there's so much talent in the state of Florida that um, it's just, I you know, and I hope that those I hope Coach Strong is able to coach those guys up, and I hope they do find success. But you know, um, it's just going to be kind of a, a tricky transition for uh, for Coach Strong. Now, I guess if you want to be technical, Burnett's technically signing out of Kansas, but he's from Pahokee, so he's really a Florida kid. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Burnett, Burnett's definitely from Pahokee. He played high school ball at Pahokee High School in Florida. So, um, you know, he it's a Florida guy. <laughs> so it'll just be an interesting bag with Coach Strong. Is he able to finally get in that top, you know, that top three in the AAC? And that's kind of where I feel like he's going to need to be to really compete, um, mm. just based on what UCF is doing. You know, right now they sort of have – almost a stranglehold on that conference on paper yeah yeah well, on the field mostly too although cincinnati they could they've been signing some guys left and right i know that's not a little off topic but um so curious to see how that works uh if you had to grade them relative to the success they should have what would you give them relatively success they should have you know like i said i think that they need to be in that top three spot i guess i would probably give an overall b minus um based on the fact that they were able to get, you know, a lot of guys on offense and defense, they were able to get a mixed bag. Where you would like to see from the Bulls is just have a little bit more success with some of those head-to-head -head battles. Um, you'll want to see them sign guys over other schools in the AAC, over other schools they're competing for those signatures for. You know, there's there's some players that, that are going to be suiting up for UCF that probably could have helped, helped Charlie Strong in Tampa. So probably mm -hmm. overall B- minus just based on the fact they were able to get an array not necessarily miss on any one position, but obviously can't go any higher than that because I don't feel like they did anything to overtake UCF either. Okay. I personally gave them a C plus. I mean, their, their highest rate was a 78 overall. And uh, I think I'm glad you explained the reason why they didn't sign so many people is because they had a class. And I think you had mentioned to me earlier that they were close to the roster limit. So that also makes sense. Yeah. Um, last year, 
So, you know, last year UCF they we, last year UCF took like twenty or USF, sorry. USF took like twenty six guys. Um so that's quite a few for like counters. And then the year before that, you know, they took twenty one. So they were sort of kind of approaching a numbers crunch there. Okay. <laughs> All the things that I, I'm glad I don't have to think about as a coach. There's a, there's a lot of things to balance, and that's one of them. <laughs> about that? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> All right. So um, we're going to move on to the FIU Panthers uh, down there in the Miami area, uh, fighting Butch Davises. So what were your impressions on how they did down there in, in Miami? Yeah, so, you know, um, FIU is kind of an intriguing place for me because Butch Davis has uh, – so much experience down there in that in that area and it kind of shows i mean the guy can still coach some football and this year he had a lot of success in coaching football panthers come off that nine and three season big win in the bahamas bowl um but they only come in at 84th ranked recruiting class so you kind of wouldn't wonder you know obviously you're gonna be in a bottom 50 because it's just a smaller school it's not one of the big three but again where i really kind of rank those sort of schools and how we kind of factor in that scale is he's only able to bring in the sixth best class in conference usa um he signs 18 players he signs two top 500 juco players um but one of them's a kicker uh tommy heatherly from northeastern oklahoma and then Logan Gunderson, who uh, out of Asa College in Miami. Now, I think Gunderson can actually be a pretty good player for them down the stretch. But you would really kind of like to see FIU just finish a little bit, maybe in the top, you know, top three in that conference. Because, again, I just think it comes down to continued continue success. Obviously, Coach Davis is a great coach. Obviously, he brought him a successful season this year. He addressed some needs. He brings in Stone Norton, the, uh, the pro-style quarterback out of Davidson Academy in Tennessee. Um, you know, he's able to bring in uh, Lexington Joseph, who I believe is their top ranked recruit at 996 overall nationally from Miami Central, Florida in Miami uh, running back. But he's an undersized guy, you know, five, six hundred and sixty pounds. Can they put enough weight on him? Can he be a legitimate uh, option for him uh, as they kind of go down the stretch of the season? So I think Coach Davis did a good job of getting uh, the players he needs at some of the positions they need him at. It's just. I would really like to see him kind of crack higher in that Conference USA ranking because there's really no reason that I don't feel like he should be able to out-recruit some of those other schools. Now, one thing um, one thing FIU did was they bring in two guys from Arkansas. So Alexi Jean-Baptiste, the outside linebacker from Arkansas, and Malik Williams, who is a running back for Arkansas, uh, 6'1", 215. So I think they're, they're going to have to sit one year, but those are still pretty big-name signees for FIU. Right, and I think there's a couple of things that uh, be interesting to just keep an eye on with the FIU Panthers this year. Um, the news came out, I think, just a day or two ago that they lost their defensive coordinator. He heads to the NFL. Will that have an impact? You know, they they have a, a pretty good reach. I know that Butch Davis, I think, has ties to Oklahoma. I think that's where he's from, which would explain um, the uh, the kicker that he got. Um, no, no five or four stars. Um, you know, but but if you look at the season they had and the success relative to the program that's existed, this is the time to capitalize. Strike while the iron's hot. You know, they won a big game. Uh, they arguably could have been in the conference championship game, and except for they they lost their last game of the year. That's probably the only thing that might have been disappointing about the season for the Panthers. But this is the time you're going to improve, and I, I would have liked to have seen it translate to a little more success, uh, like you mentioned. So. Hopefully now is the time that Bush kind of gets things rolling and has a little bit more sustained success there. Eight or nine wins going forward with the talent he has. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, obviously, you know, like you, you mentioned, you would like to be able to see a little more success in the recruiting trail. You'd like to be able to see Coach Davis sustain success. Uh, coach Davis is going to be a great coach for that conference, a great coach for that program. So, you know, I mean, I, cu- I couldn't agree with you more on that assessment. If I had to rate FIU's class, I mean, it's really hard to rate those – and that's why I kind of go back so much to those conference, how you finish in the conference, um, just because that's a good gauge of your competition. So honestly, even though Coach Davis did meet a lot of needs, and I kind of, kind of go on the opposite side of the, uh, the USF argument there. So I know I'm kind of contradicting myself a little bit, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I probably would give him a C plus. Okay. I think that I think he needed the, I need to think he needed to do a better job against some of those other conference USA schools. All right. 
I don't think both of our assessments are pretty fair. So, all right. So there's one more school, and I know that you're a big, big Lane Kiffin fan. So that's kind of why I save this one for last. Um, the FAU Owls over in Boca Raton, Florida. Um, what were your thoughts on some needs that they met, some things they missed on, and just some overall thoughts and things that stood out to you? Yeah. So FAU's class, man. I, I uh, sorry, FIU. Sorry. Um, I get my school or FAU. Sorry, I get my schools mixed up sometimes, but. <laughs> FAU is FAU is a it's such a, a a crazy dynamic, and I really like following the school because you have Coach Kiffin, who is you know this kind of wild kind of like gunslinger coach out down there at this like really tiny school. He has great success last season, comes into like a really kind of bad season this year at five and seven is what they what they finished what yeah. they finished with. Um, he lands with Trail Jean, the defensive end out of Lakeland. He lands Demonte Howard, the outside linebacker of Miami Southridge, who I think we absolutely should keep an eye on for them down the road. Hard to project some of these players, but Lakeland is a power, and Gene did have a pretty good season at defensive end for them, opposite Summerall, uh, who signed with Florida. So I think that I think that those players, uh, especially Howard, the, the linebacker we just mentioned, I think that I think he could do some good things for them. Cameron Wynn is another name I would really keep an eye on for them. He's a uh, he's an athlete basically. I'm not entirely sure where Lane Kiffin's going to line him up at uh, wide receiver, running back, maybe quarterback. I mean, I'm not really sure what they're going to do with Win, but he's out of Notre Dame High School in Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, and he's a really dynamic athlete. So I really would be interested to see where what they do with Win. I think he could do some big things for him. FAU is traditionally a story of who transferred in, right? So mm-hmm. that's kind of always the fun story with FAU. Uh, but this year, so far, no big, no big crazy transfers for FAU. So I feel like Coach Kiffin's kind of let me down. You know, I need some last chance you guys. Where am I? I need the, I need last chance you 2.0 after every season. I need somebody, you know, on the field. So I'm a little disappointed. Now, one thing he was able to do is bring in the number one class in Conference USA. Yeah. So um, I'll get into that a little bit more, but there's kind of, he kind of did it um, in a really interesting way where on paper it looks really good, but when you actually open the book of that and start looking at the paper, he kind of he kind of found a loophole because he signed 33 players. Yeah, that was a lot. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> so, <laughs> so FAU is kind of benefiting from some guys leaving, losing some counters and that. Um, that counting signing kind of a – and I want to say – if I'm if I'm correct on this, I would have to check it, but I want to say that last year FAU brought in only 15 guys. Okay. So that kind of has a lot to do with it. Is you know you bring in 15 guys in the 2018 class. I think they brought in 20 guys in the 17 class, um, and then you know you're going to lose a lot of players to graduation. I think they signed 19 in the 16 class. So there were some numbers to be had for this class, and Coach Kiffin just. Uh, decided to fill all of them, uh, bringing, in, bringing in 33 players, which really kind of propped up that class ranking. Yes, um, I I think that's that's a very big win for them. And I, you know, they you were talking about big transfers. DeAndre Johnson, you know, was a guy that was uh, transfer. He was he ran into some trouble problems at Florida State, had to transfer out, and he goes to FAU and mostly served as a backup last year. Um, so I'm curious to see how what his future holds. But, you know, he, he does really well with what he has. Um, more than any other coach, uh, at least in the state, in my opinion, he's very good at that. So that's what's always impressed me. And, he you know, he doesn't lack any personality either, so that tends to help. Yeah, no, it's – it's. I mean, if there's a guy – if there's any guy in the country that you, I guess, could want to bring attention to your program, I mean, I don't know that you want Lane Kiffin bringing attention to your program, but if you're FAU, I mean, why not, you right. know? <laughs> right. Like, why not just go just go all in? But uh, you know, Kiffin's really toned down over the years. You know, a lot of college football fans still remember him as like, you know, the OC at SC or the head coach at Tennessee, kind of like with all of the out, off the field and all the shenanigans and telling Alshon Jeffrey that if he didn't sign with Tennessee, he was going to be pumping his gas and things like that. <laughs> like a lot of people still remember that Coach Kiffin, FAU Coach Kiffin is like a very toned down version of that Coach Kiffin. So. He's still really fun to listen to because you, you still got the air of uncertainty, but, you know, maybe more focused on coaching football these days. Right. <laughs> so, 
You know, they I don't know. I think they're a fun program to follow. Um, he did sign the 33 players. So all in all, I would probably, I don't know. Um, <laughs> number one, number one class propped up by the 33 players he signed. So I don't know. I, I got love for Coach Kiffin, so I'll go with my heart on this vote and go with an A minus. <laughs> I don't know. It's that's, just so hard to project. That's kind of where I thought you'd land on that, and it's, it's pretty still pretty fair. Um, I I would assume it's enough to have success in Conference USA, and that it's you're at a point now, Kiffin. I think you're coming into your third year. You need to be bowl eligible every year. I don't think there's any excuse for not getting at least that much out of your players at this point. What what um what would you say you know in regards to Coach Kiffin? What's the outlook for him? You know, in in the next three years, do you think Coach Kiffin will still be at FAU? You know, I've I've toyed with that question, Jared, because every time a job opens up, it, it definitely casts the Lane Kiffin shadow. Um, the other thing that's kind of surprised me is you know I look over his coaching record; he never stayed anywhere very long, and. You know, he he could grow some roots there in Boca Raton. I don't know, but every time a main position opens, you know, anytime you're an SEC head coach, you're going to be considered for a job somewhere. Um, and if I had to be honest, I'd say no, just because the school is so young, and yeah, it's it's kind of like a, the fun link of an experiment. But I honestly don't know where else he would be an interesting cultural fit for. And he certainly can recruit. But, you know, sometimes guys like Charlie Strong and like Lane Kiffin, sometimes they're just better suited for the lesser conferences. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so, you know, I very much enjoyed Lane Kiffin at FAU. And if it were me selfishly, I would hope he would be there just because it would be fun to see if he could continue to grow that program. But with you, I just don't think that we're going to see Coach Kiffin at FAU maybe in the next three seasons. But one thing that kind of – you know, argue against us is we've had so many openings the past two seasons and no one's even called him. So maybe, maybe there's a chance for FAU and coach Kiffin. Um, you know, he is finding success there. He had a bad season this season. I think people expected more, but he lost a lot, you know? So as they continue to come on and continue to grow, he's still a pretty innovative offensive mind. Um, he'll get speed there in the conference, like you mentioned. It should be enough to be successful in that conference. So, you know, it should be interesting. Uh, it should be an interesting dynamic. I, I guess my, I would say that I wouldn't expect him to be there, but there was just so many openings this past season, and, you know, no one really brought his name up. So <laughs> it was just kind of – and, I, you know, I mean – we've had coaches repair their images in a much shorter time. You know, he went to Alabama and had a great run as an OC and you kind of would expect him to be in those, uh, in the conversation for some of those power five jobs. But so far he hasn't. Right. I mean, Kansas took less miles out of retirement. Uh, Charlie strong was my pick for that. I kind of, that was really kind of dumb. Um, you think, okay, well, Miami's maybe they want to, Take a look at him. That's right down the road. No, nope, no interest. So, yeah, maybe you're right. Yeah, you're onto something because you know there's there's been <laughs> no big name school. And I mean, really, at this point, if Ohio State do, would they really have called Kiffin? You know, I don't think so. Uh, mm-hmm. Would he go back to USC if that job opens up? No, there's rumors Urban Meyer would come out of retirement. So, you know, coming out of retirement seems to be the way to go. So maybe he should retire for a year and then he gets an offer at a big school. So. Yeah. Go work at go work at ESPN, you know, <laughs> get some FaceTime in and uh, maybe, maybe you're right. <laughs> you know, one thing I will say um, about Coach Kiffin FAU, Butch Davis, um, you know, Coach Strong and obviously Coach Heupel is, you know, when, when we talk recruiting for these schools, we're talking a much different dynamic than we're talking like with the big three. And with the big three, we can really use that top 10, that nationally ranked top 10 is a good barometer for success. Uh, when you look at Alabama's classes, when you look at Clemson's classes, when you look at Oklahoma, well, Oklahoma's not a good uh, example. But when you look at when you look at sort of those top tier schools um, and you look at kind of where Georgia, you know, finishes nationally, you can really use that sort of national thing as a good as a good gauge for, you know, this postseason team should find success based on the last three or four classes. But when we talk um, these non, these non group of five schools, we, we have to really use a different gauge because we can't always look at the national rankings 
for success. And UCF is a great example of this. And we touched on that a little bit when we went on with the when we were talking about their school. But you know, you're looking at a team that finishes every year in the fifty to sixty range in recruiting. Um, they come off two undefeated seasons. They have some really big wins. Now I know they lost to LSU, but they you know, if Mackenzie Milton's in that game, you know, you can what if the scenario to death. If LSU had all of its defensive starters and McKenzie Milton if both teams are at full strength, that's still going to be a really competitive game. And so you look at LSU, who's traditionally recruited in the top 10, um, you know, for the past decade, pretty much. So it's really a different gauge we have to use for these for the non group of five schools, because you can't use the national ranking as, you know, is this a win or is this a loss uh, in recruiting? Because a lot of those coaches have to do a lot of legwork. Um, that maybe some of your group five schools don't have to do, mm-hmm. you know, maybe I, I don't really know what that process would be. And it would be uh, fun uh, to kind of learn about how coach Happel goes on to assess the players that they recruit, because, you know, maybe you're probably, you know, you're, you're probably marking a lot of guys off your list before you start. Um, oh. And you're still able to find a lot of success in that. So, you know, I think, I think overall, when we talk UCF, we talk USF, FAU, FIU, you know, we're talking about filling needs. And overall, I think most of our Florida non group of five schools did a pretty decent job of that. Absolutely. And, and some of the thoughts on UCF, they're doing it with about half of the budget. Um, some of the other schools are doing it with. And they've had such a great turnaround. That's the biggest success story to me is they go from a winless season at the end of George O'Leary's tenure. Uh, and then you bounce back and go undefeated into your – I mean, that's just unprecedented in every definition of the word. So – you know that's that's something else you're up against is you don't have the funds and the backing that you may have, but sustained success like Florida State did with Bobby Bowden or with uh, Chris Peterson up at Boise State when he was there, that's what's going to continue to get the recruits and the name recognition and keep them at the top of their conference and to keep them in the national conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you we we talk about UCF obviously more because of the success they've had there, but you know as we go forward. Do you feel like Coach Hyper will, will be able to sustain that success? Well, it's, it's going to be tough. Obviously, you go in regular season undefeated. It really depends on how the rest of the AAC shakes out. You know, What, is, what does Holgerson do at Houston? Um, does Tulsa ever come back? The, the answer is probably no. East Carolina is used to give them games, and now they're just one of the worst coasts in the, East Confer- on the Eastern Seaboard. Excuse me. You know, South Florida doesn't seem to be doing much with the talent they have. You know, you thought they had a good team uh, coming back from 17 to 18. They start off winning seven games and then they lost their last six. So, you know, they need uh, more competition and they don't play Memphis every year. That's probably the team where you're like, okay, this is going to get them stronger. Uh, Memphis is going to give them a good game, but they rotated them out of their side. They're on the other side of the AC, so they're not going to play them unless it's in the title game again <laughs> for the third straight year. Yeah. Um, Getting stronger opponents constantly is what's going to improve the school there, and yeah, they're doing what they can to get that. They've even actually kind of held out their their schedule. Uh, the first game this year is against FAMU, and they've kind of said it's either going to be that first game, that first week of games on Thursday or Saturday. We're not sure. Hmm. We have a contract, and we'll play FAMU if we have to, but we're looking for a better opponent. Hmm. So. They're kind of saying to themselves, we're going to go out there, we're going to challenge ourselves as much as we possibly can, but we also know that the decision about who you play is done by the higher-ups, and it's also done four or five years out, so there's not a whole lot of control you have over it. Yeah, I mean, I think those games are the type of games that you know are really going to help you recruiting, um, especially for a school like UCF, who you used Boise State earlier, and I think that's a great example. Um, for UCF is that, you know, if you're able to continue to play those marquee games, you're able to continue to put yourself in that spotlight. That could really be the separation from a top 50 class to all of a sudden, maybe you're knocking on the doors of the twenties and the thirties. And, you know, you're really starting to consistently bring in those top 25 classes. And then that really starts to transition that program from, uh, kind of something that is a, you know, we consider as maybe an anomaly or a fun story for a few years to, you know, hey, UCF's going to be there uh, next year. So, you know, that's – I really feel like that's really kind of how you close that talent gap. Um, you know, 15 years ago, nobody really cared if they played Boise State. But, you know, 
10 years ago in those in those bowl games when they were upsetting Oklahoma's and doing things like that. Not many people wanted to put them on the schedule. And as UCF continues to be that school that not many people want to see, they're going to continue to to up those recruiting rankings. Yeah. There you go. It's exciting to see. I mean, it helps the whole state uh, top to bottom, and it's certainly fun. Um, it's also a little painful, especially to see Florida State. This is probably the – well, it is the worst year I've seen of my lifetime <laughs> for the Knolls. And to see it uh, at the time that the, the – well, the Gators and the Knights uh, both excelling way more than us. Uh, but um, I, I also love the whole state of Florida. Obviously, that's why we named the show. That's why we do it. And so, I, you know, I don't begrudge him too much for that success. <laughs> no, absolutely not. But, yeah, it should be an interesting year. Uh, this coming state, you have a lot of teams who fill a lot of needs. Um, you know, we've talked about pretty much all the Florida schools. Uh, if I had to pick, if I had to pick really uh, just a handful of players I was really excited about seeing their careers, um, you know, I would look at Akeem Dent from Florida State. I would look at Chris Steele from Florida. And really kind of my wild card in there is um, is FAU's own Cameron Wynn. I just <laughs> I just want to see what Kevin's able to do with him. Yeah. That's a good get. I always love it when you just see ATH because you never know. I think there was a guy for Florida State. Uh, they he's he's he was signed as a, a def, I think a defensive back. It must might be Travis J. But he also played quarterback in high school, and there was a joke they asked the <laughs> Kendall Bras about, hey, would he play quarterback? He's like, well, he could pretty much do anything. So, <laughs> given the scenario, yeah, think, Florida State quarterbacks is not unheard of. He may do it. I think it was Travis J. Actually, um, because you know when they were coming in, maybe only saw that one roster somebody asked about was I think it was at a press conference that you're referencing. Um, but yeah, you know Travis J. is also another wonderful athlete, and hopefully. Florida State's not in a position where he has to play quarterback, but I mean, I guess, I I guess if all else fails. Right. Right. Excellent. Well, uh, Jared can't thank you enough for coming on the show and kind of giving us a recap. That's, that's a very good resource to have, um, is you. And, uh, just to reiterate to the fans, Jared is the reason why Chris and I even met each other. So we're also eternally thankful for that. Oh, absolutely, man. It's always a pleasure to come on the show. Always a pleasure to talk Florida football. Awesome. Well, um, quick uh, couple of things here for the fans. Thank you, of course, so much for listening. Uh, maybe you'd like to be a guest on the show, and there's a couple of ways you can do that. The first thing is we're going to ask that everybody send us um, in an, a voice recording uh, to a question that we're going to leave out there for a little while. And Jared, I mentioned the question that we're going to ask for the fans, and you, you sounded really excited off the bat, so I knew it was a good one. Um, between now and over the next couple of weeks, we want to hear from you. Let's pretend that you are a five-star recruit. What coach would you like to recruit you, and why would you like that coach to recruit you? We're not going to limit this to the state of Florida. We, this can be any coach over the entire country. But we do ask that it is a current coach. And we'd like to know why you would want that coach to recruit you. So very curious on that. Um, <laughs> I guess we'll we'll wait to hear your answer, Jared. But did, did a coach come to your mind uh, first right off the bat when I presented that question to you? Absolutely. When you first present that question, I actually had two coaches come straight to my mind. So I'll be very uh, – I'll be looking forward to sending in my answer. All right. Yeah, look forward to it as well. So um, you can do that by emailing the show, Podcast at yahoo.com. Uh, you can also find our all of our contact information on our website, com. So if you look for us on Facebook, uh, we are on YouTube. You can listen to our episodes there. We do have a Twitter account. That's probably the fastest way to get a hold of us and the most current information. We're also on Instagram, and I do want to announce uh, my quick update to our Patreon site, patreon.com slash Podcast. Um, we have two tiers um, if you're willing to make a contribution of either $1 a month or $5 a month. Uh, that is why Jared's on the show today. Anyone who is on the $5 a month contribution, we, are, we really want to consider you as a guest to be on the show. So that's another way you can be a guest, and we would love to have you on. So if, if you want to look at those tiers, a $1 a month gets you in. We'll send you a handwritten thank you note. Uh, we will also send you a free product. Yes, I said free. Uh, from one of our sponsors so you know there's really nothing to lose there any last thoughts on recruiting jared or what you're looking forward to in the offseason from the florida schools 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, no really last thoughts in recruiting. I'm definitely looking forward to see how some of the early enrollees develop around the country. Looking forward to seeing who gets on the field early, whose names get mentioned, and maybe if any of those guys are able to crack the starting depth chart or opening day depth chart. So just looking forward to getting into the spring and seeing how some of the some of how the new guys affect the dynamics on our current teams. Yes. Great time of year. Thanks again, Jared. Um, to all of our fans, uh, we, we would appreciate any feedback. We look forward to hearing from you guys with that question. If you're a five-star recruit, what coach do you want recruiting you and why? So this is Brandon saying go Knowles.